All right, welcome to the show. Made it to episode 12 of the Upper Midwest Old Timey Listening Party. I'm your host, Clawhammer Mike, here for another, what, hour? I'm not exactly sure ever how long these shows are going to run. In fact, I'm not even sure if these shows are going to happen from week to week. We took a couple weeks off. A couple weeks ago, we had that big Bruce Bolarud memorial special. That was really fun, and uh, we got to talk to a bunch of Bruce's friends. And you can still catch that one if you go to the page. Um, it's it's uh, that was a special episode for Bruce Bolarud. Um, but yeah, I just I never know because uh, you know, do people do people love the show? I know some people do. You know, I. I I like doing it. It's a it's a labor of love. Um, if you want to contribute to the show, we got uh, the info up in the corner. If PayPal is unarmedjournal at hotmail dot com and Venmo is at Clawhammer Mike, that'll help keep the show going too. Especially you know if you haven't haven't tipped in the past and you know you're watching this live or you're watching it in a few weeks, um, you know you can you can go ahead and tip if you want to. You don't have to though free programming so uh this week you know uh it started off i you know when i wasn't sure if i was gonna do it or not um i started reaching out for interviews and one of the interviews that i hooked up with first was uh bud larson and bud larson is a really cool dude for those of you who don't know him he's a luthier meaning he works he mates and works on musical instruments up in the brainerd area of minnesota and um, he specifically makes hard downer fiddles and works on hard downer fiddles. And he specifically learned from a man um, named Gunnar Helland, who's kind of a legend in the upper Midwest. The Helland brothers came over from Norway and settled in Chippewa Falls in the early 1900s. And they were kind of known in the early 1900s as kind of like the go-to hard honor folks in the upper Midwest. So, um, you know, that's that was fascinating. And when I did the interview with him, he's, he's just got all kinds of interesting stories. So I was like, oh, yeah, we definitely got to do another episode. Plus, I had already interviewed Quill and Rowe. You know, we, we started doing um, modern old-time folks and the music that they do instead of always looking back at to what the what the old timers are playing. Now we're trying to look at what some of the modern folks do and Quillen's my buddy. I love him to pieces. Great guy, great musician. Um and he I interviewed him maybe a month and a half ago and and I knew that interview was good. So that's a good basis for a show right there. Plus um I've I added I scrounged up a few different things that I that I think are really interesting this week. Um one of them came out of the blue. Uh, this this young person sent me a email saying, "Hey, my grandfather was a fiddler in northern Minnesota." He actually sent me the the email three years ago, and uh, and one of my CDs was late getting out to him. And uh, he said, "Hey, man, it's like I love what you're doing, but you know, could you send me that CD?" And I was like, "Oh yeah, it's in the mail." And then he said, "Oh, my my grandfather was a fiddler." And I was like, I was like, oh man, I'm interested. Tell me more. But um, uh, I never did hear back for him too too much. And now three years later, he says, oh yeah, I got all these tapes. And you know, when I hear the word tapes, my eyes my eyes get big. I, I definitely want to hear them, and they are great. And they're they're really they're really fascinating. So we're gonna play some of his music tonight for sure. Get to that. And uh, then um, when I was scrounging through some other tapes. Um, I realized this fellow that for some reason is not on my radar named Ted Johnson. He was a band leader here in Minneapolis in the early 1900s, specifically the 1930s and the 1940s, uh, Norwegian American band leader. And, uh, his stuff actually got like recorded and, uh, like professionally and he had a big orchestra. And so you get to hear, you know, a Norwegian American orchestra with like vibraphone and stuff like that. It's pretty, pretty great, pretty great music. So we're going to play some of that tonight. We're going to kind of have lots of music tonight, you know, two or three songs by a bunch of different fellers. And then the other thing that I found that was interesting this week was uh, um, this radio station up in um, War Road uh, had this old timey show. And I just, I wandered across a tape of this old time show and I played it and it's just, it was really pretty special. 
and um, they had some in-house fiddlers from the area come in and play, a fiddle, a banjo player, and a guitar. So we're going to hear from them too. So anyways, we do have kind of a special show tonight. Um, I think I think a lot of great content for y'all. So we're going to start off with this fellow here, Nels Egeland. I hope I'm saying that right, Egeland, E-G-E-L-A-N-D. And um, he, he's, the, he's the grandfather of the person who contacted me, this fiddler from back in the day. And it ends up that he knew some of our fellows that we have talked about before. He was definitely friends with the Sorensons. Um, he has some relation to Newt Sorensen. Somebody married somebody. I can't remember the exact details. But um, and, he knew, and he played with Truman Sorensen up there. And he probably played with Selma Ramsey um, from, from what we think. We think we might have a tape of uh, Selma playing with him. So this is fascinating to us. So let's, let's dive into him here. Uh, Nels was born in Thompson, North Dakota, just south of Grand Forts in 1909. He lived in Plummer in East Grand Forts, Minnesota, where he died in 1976. He worked as a farmer, farmhand, and various odd jobs. He played fiddle for his family and friends and played in some contests in places like High Landing and Oakley. He never played dances or any concerts. He won a yellow ribbon from a, a Fargo fiddle contest in 1974. Nels and his wife, Phil Lomina, had ten children, but unfortunately none of them played fiddle. So we know that those are very sim f familiar themes to our to our show there, almost, almost all of them. So we're going to hear Nels play a shotish here. Straight stuff. So that was Nels. Like I say, great, great old shotish there. I've already transcribed that shotish, and it's really super fun to play on the film. So now we're going to hear a mazurka. Um, this is a great, great mazurka. <laughs> Thank you. 
gotta love how fast and crisp he played that mazurka. The shotish too. I don't know, maybe the tape's a little sped up, but both the, both the shotish and the mazurka was going on a, a quite a quite a lively clip there. So um, I think right off the bat we're gonna get into this Bud Larson interview. Um, it was great chat chatting with the fellow, and uh, he's just an all around great guy. And we're gonna go into a bunch of different facets of uh, you know why he's why he's such a great great person here. All right, this is Clawhammer Mike back here. We're with Bud Larson here. I know Bud Larson, man. He's a great, great instrument maker. He uh, studied back with Gunnar Helen back in the day. So that's a really, really fascinating story that, of course, we'll get into today. And uh, he's doing this great work up in the Brainerd area up there. With uh, he's, He has all kinds of different apprentices over the years that he's, that he's uh, helped out. And he just seems like just such a great guy who's, you know, really, really into making hard honor fiddles. So we wanted to talk to, we wanted to talk to Bud Larson today. How's it going today, Bud? Oh, we're doing, doing well. Yeah. We've uh, sitting here in our shop where I teach by Zoom to our new apprentices. We've got uh, uh, two old apprentices and three new apprentices working on building hard honor fiddles this year over in Fargo. Ruth Dramstead, she did very well, made a beautiful fiddle, and uh, has really gotten into it. So this year she's learning uh, violin repair as well, and going through all the processes. She set up a little shop there in, in um, over just north of Fargo, and she's learning how to be a violin repairman, and she's building her second Hardanger fiddle. Wow, great. How many people have you taught to build fiddles over the years? Oh, well, let's see. You're, if we talk about Hardanger fiddles, I've had nine people in the program who have built. Um, and, uh, but I've taught a lot of other instrument building and violin building too uh, mm -hmm. in Indonesia and Fiji and uh, in Papua New Guinea and various places where we've worked and traveled. Yeah, I see one of your students. He always has his fiddle, uh, you know, overseas. I don't, I can't remember what country he's from, but it always is great to see him with his with his hard honor fiddle, and he's he's you know overseas in some. Was, I think it's the guy in Papua New Guinea. I think yeah. So. Yeah, there are two of them. Well, I, I guess three of them are playing regularly on Facebook, share their music, and uh, two of them are hard honor, have built hard honor fiddles, but. You know, for them, it's a simpler version because when I've gone there to teach, I only have like three to six weeks to teach them how to build and play a fiddle. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've simplified it quite a bit for them. But still, they sound, they sound pretty good. And uh, the one guy took off and made an instrument shop. And um, I think he's probably the one who's, he plays Scandinavian tunes every once in a while. Mm -hmm. But that's uh, in uh, Sentani, Papua, Indonesia. Wow, he's he's made quite a number of instruments. What um what what propels that? What 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 was it, what was your drive to get other folks to be able to know how to do this straight steel that you know? Yeah, well, it wasn't it wasn't only only me, but we. Uh, I've always enjoyed teaching very much. I love to see a student who's excited in learning you know you they're kind of nowadays few and far between those who really get excited about a subject it seems so many students nowadays have a i dare you to teach me something attitude but when you get someone who's really curious about building and hard hunger fiddles and music and you get them as a student then it's very for me very motivating inspiring to just keep on teaching them we work with Troyd Geist, the North Dakota State folklorist, who uh, gave us the link to the North Dakota Council for the Arts, who has a grant program. So when a student wants to learn how to build hard hunger fiddles, we apply for a North Dakota State grant. I suppose you could do it in, in uh, other states too. We did it once in Minnesota, but, but uh, it's, we've been mainly working with North Dakota students. And 
um, we get a grant for up to $3,000 a year and uh, that pays for travel and all the tools that they need and and uh, so it's a it's a neat program so that's how we do it I know that you learned from Mr. Helen. Uh, was it was it your relationship with him? Maybe go into a little bit about your relationship with him and how you got started, both you know making fiddles and your interest in hard honor fiddle in particular. My dad was a, a fiddler, and uh, that's how he met my mom. Actually, she was a pianist, and they met back in the nineteen twenties uh, in North Dakota, and he. He was a fiddler and she was a pianist, so they did a lot of barn dances together. And uh, then he became a, a collector of fiddles and a fiddle teacher, and just as an avocation. And he collected, uh, well, let's see, the fiddles that you see over here were his fiddles. Oh. Um, now most, uh, at least a couple of them were, but he had a good collection of Hardunger fiddles, all built by Gunnar Hillen. Then one year we moved into a building above the Kresge store in Fargo on Broadway. And uh, right down the hall from us was Gunnar Hillon's shop. And my dad was born in Norway and uh, Gunnar of course came from Norway. So they uh, had a good, they were, they were good family friends. So I bugged Helen a lot, Gunnar. I bugged him a lot, hung around her shop. And then when I was in the seventh grade, he gave me my first fiddle to fix up, which uh, my granddaughter in the seventh grade has just recently restored again. Oh, <laughs> but cool. that, was a, that was a neat passing on the skills thing to do in our family. But then when I was in the ninth grade, I began working uh, in Gunner's shop. He invited me to be his apprentice and uh, I learned bow rehearing and all the different things you need to do to fix violins. But you know, Hardunger fiddles had kind of died out the interest in those days. And he had one fiddle hanging in his shop there that he had built in 1938. That was the very last one he built. And uh, that's the one I said, Gunnar, why don't you ever finish that fiddle? And he, uh, that there's no interest anymore. Although people would come into our shop and we'd work on our longer fiddles, but he wasn't building any. But he left that to me in the white. And he said, someday you can finish that for me. <laughs> so that's the one, 73 years after he started it, I finished it. That's great. <laughs> so that's, wow. that's uh, and this, this one actually we brought to Norway a couple of years ago and it was played in Gunnar's father's house, where, where Gunnar came from in Be Telemark. And, That's so uh, cool. So the thing has was built by Gunnar, uh, and uh, returned to his boyhood home, and uh, so it's got a lot of history in that one. So he had it all in the white, and you just put it, you put it together, and did all the inlay and all that stuff. So yeah, it was in the white, and I just did all the rosing and actually I took it apart and uh, it was apart for years and I was studying it and because you know in 1991 when we uh, came back to live in Brainerd we noticed that there was quite an interest in Hardanger fiddles so I had Gunner's old fiddle so I took it all apart measured it and got some good patterns from it and so that's the uh, building tradition that we follow in our apprenticeship program. And uh, cool. because there was a revived interest, then I started building them for people. And I guess I've built uh, oh, 40 some of them since then, yeah. which isn't a high number compared to Gunner who had built 300 or more of them. But, uh, yeah. you know, it's a good start. Yeah, so do you remember, do you have any cool stories from back in the day with him? Do you remember any of any of any lessons that he might have taught you or any 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 stories of interesting interesting days in the shop or anything like that? One one quick one is that he his grandson used to come around and uh, make plastic model airplanes in the shop there and he was quite interested in that. He was a bit younger than I was. So uh I got to meet him and, and 
know him a bit back when he was a kid. And just a year ago, he had found a uh, fiddle hanging on somebody's wall and uh, bought it. And it was his, built by his grandfather. Oh. So I restored that for him just uh, last year. And so it it's, uh, came back into the family after all those years. That was interesting. That's really cool. Um, you know, Gunnar and I used to uh, go out for coffee and sit in a cafe. We'd each buy a cigar and we'd sit there and we'd smoke cigars and talk about all the his uh, youth and all the stories that he had when he was growing up. And that was kind of interesting. I mean, actually, it was quite interesting. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. And he used to be a great skier, he and his brother, Knut, who died when he was... I think in his 30s or so in Wisconsin. Yeah. But uh, the two of them used to have a shop together, you know, over there in Chippewa Falls. Uh -huh. But uh, Gunner and his brother used to, used to close up the shop when the snow fell and then they'd go ski jumping. They were great ski jumpers and they had won many medals for, for ski jumping. And uh, so that was their winter sport. Well, let's see. I could show you show you the shop here. Here, here we go. There's there's Gunner sitting in his shop. I keep that above my work bench here, so it's kind of inspiring me. That's a great old picture. I have another photo of myself sitting in the same place. Oh, cool. When I was in uh, the a senior in high school, I used to do a lot of portrait painting. So. I painted a picture of that one, and uh, it was about three three feet by four feet painting, a big one. And uh, later, that was sent to Norway as a gift to a sister city. And uh, it hung in the museum there in uh, Sheehan for quite a while. But when we were in Norway a couple of years ago, we got them to move that painting over to the to the museum in Bö. They have an excellent Hardanger Fiddle Museum there, the folk museum there. And so now that painting that I did when I was, I was uh, 16 years old now hangs in the museum there. That's so cool. <laughs> um, you, so your father played and got you into the music. And what, did he mostly play Schadish's, polkas, waltzes, or what, what was his repertoire? Or did he play the old stuff too? Did he play hardanger fiddle at all? He did. He did play hardanger fiddle, but he wasn't very, very good at the uh, uh, the uh, big the dance music, okay. the old style. He didn't do that very much, but he played a lot of uh, gummel dance, the same kind that you play. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's mainly what he played, and that's what people like to dance to, of course. Um, and uh, he was very protective of his instruments. Hardly would take them out because he wanted to keep them in excellent condition. Yeah. But uh, I've completely changed that when I inherited his instruments. <laughs> I let people play them and I want them used and played as much as possible. Yes. And I always say, oh, don't worry about it. If it breaks, I know someone who can fix them. You know, I'm not I'm not a great fiddler myself, but uh, I do enjoy a lot of uh, gamel dance music, and I usually uh, go to the Hemkomps festival every year and the Host Fest, both which of which were canceled this year. But uh, I'm get to be the roving fiddler there in the dining room at the Hemkomps uh, Scandinavian festival each year and uh, walk around and play all kinds of hardanger fiddle and gamel dance music tunes for people. So we do that. And I'm a member of the Fargo Spellman's Log. The Spellman's Log there is uh, an outgrowth of the apprenticeship program and the, and the fiddles that we've built for people in Fargo area. And uh, that's, that's one of the better Spellman's logs around right now, I think. Um, it has uh, oh, anywhere from eight to 12 members in it, and they're still having a good time doing that. 
Gunner was very particular about the workmanship. It had a very high standard. And uh, he said, when I, when I be, uh, this is a, a bow that I built, but he oh, taught cool. me how to uh, rehear bows. And he said, he wouldn't say that I was any good at it until after I'd he rehaired 200 of them. <laughs> so I kept track we heard all the bows every year for the Fargo Moorhead school system and people all around Minnesota and North Dakota. And uh, so after 200, I think I, he, he said, then I reheard all the bows after that because, because, and he used to say, it, if, if I ever asked how well, how good should it be? He used to say, the mobli akkurat some horpo in snow other uh, Skalit Svenska. He used to say Snell Svenska, but Skalit Svenska is, I think, what a better interpretation. And that meant, that was his Norwegian phrase, that it's got to be exact as the hair on a bald-headed Swede. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> you can't get a finer distinction than that. Yeah. <laughs> Many of the people in the Fargo-Moorhead Symphony played his fiddles and he used to say that that symphony had the hell on sound because of all the violins that he'd built for those people. All right. Well, thank you, Bob, for spending time with us today. I really appreciate it. Uh, your, some of your stories are great about, you know, the history, the history of, you know, we don't hear much about the Helen brothers and especially Gunnar Helen anymore. So it's great to bring that to light for a little bit. You you talked earlier about how uh, a lot of a lot of you know folks don't want to take the time to learn something, but also you know a lot of folks don't want to take the time to teach something. So you know I appreciate all you do in that regard. So well, thank you, thank yeah. you, Mike. Thanks for spending time with us. You like to be called Mike or Clawhammer? Uh, I'm good either way. <laughs> either way, yeah. <laughs> yeah. As long as you're not calling me something mean, we're all good. So oh, okay. <laughs> All right. I'll call you anything, but don't call you late for dinner, huh? Exactly. So. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thanks, bud. All right, so that was Bud Larson. He's great. Um, yeah. So the two things that two things I didn't cover in that interview with Bud that I have to have to cover. One is is that um, he he oh they they got these hard honor specials that um different different outposts of PBS have have put out and um pbs the national company is going to pick up all three of them this october and i can't remember the date on that i looked it up but i couldn't find it but i know in october they're going to run all three of them and um, bud is featured in one of them his his apprentice program is featured in one of them and then i think the fardo spellman slot that he's a part of is in another one so uh, definitely keep your eyes out for those. I guess they're going to run them on, on one night, and uh, that'll be real cool, real real special night there on PBS coming up in October. Um, so, yeah. So thanks, Bud, for hanging out with us. You know, that was, that was a real treat. Um, I was digging through uh, some video files. I kind of always dig through video files to uh, for this show. What I was really hoping to have is I was hoping to unearth my um, when I went up the my, two trips ago when I went up to northwestern Minnesota, I ended up um, talking to somebody's son who was in Selma Ramsey's old band back in the day. So you know his dad was in Selma Ramsey's band. And he ended up telling me on the phone when I got a hold of him that he had this tape from uh, that somebody recorded to vinyl from Selma Ramsey's band playing on the radio in like the 50s or something like that. And of course, there's no, there's nothing like that out there. So I, I, all I had for a recorder during that trip was my video camera. So I set up my video camera, and really the video camera, it's kind of funny. The video is just capturing, um, it's in this really old creamery up in Goodridge, Minnesota. The video is just capturing like the cobwebs on the shelf, kind of moving in the wind. But the music is uh, Selma Ramsey's band playing on the radio up there for, uh, you know, some hour special that they did, old-time radio back in the 50s, where bands would just come and play live. But um, 
I couldn't share it with you guys, unfortunately, because the sound quality was just a little too bad to put to put on uh, through this filter through through Facebook. But um, but somehow I'll share that. But anyways, when I was going through that, I was like, oh yeah, I took video of um, the Upper Midwest Folk Fiddlers, our band, our our learner band that learns all these all these great tunes that I play on the show. Um, our learner band played at the Tapestry last year before COVID hit, uh, late last year, and uh, I remember that I did I did have some. I did have my partner take some video of that, so I thought I'd share one of that. This is one of Leonard Finces' tunes, Waltz in D. I show those kind of videos so you can see um, that the music isn't dead, that it's not just relegated to old tapes of old guys who've been gone for a long time, but that we, you know, uh, there's several dozen of us who try to carry it on in various different forms throughout the Upper Midwest, you know. So, so yeah, I mean, it's it's good to show that there's it's a living tradition, you know. Um, anyways, next up we're going to have the, uh, I talked earlier about how, the, um, I didn't really know about this Ted Johnson person. You know, my cipher in this area of upper Midwest music is mostly home recordings. And, uh, I didn't really exactly pay attention to, uh, the commercial recordings that were made back in the day. But man, these, these are great. You know, you'll hear, uh, crazy percussion, vibraphone, all kinds of stuff. So this is, uh, Ted Johnson. Johnson and uh, his orchestra and recorded way back in the 30s and uh, this is the Stockholm Polka <laughs> Thank you. 
All right, we're going to hear some more Ted Johnson and his group here. We're going to run three tracks here for you. <laughs> is super fun music i don't know how i never heard of that in my life but um i found it on this tape and it's and i guess they have a record an lp called gommel dance ted 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 johnson's something orchestra and uh it was put out in the 70s of all these tapes that were made in the of the in the 30s i how I didn't know anything about this, I don't know. You know, he was a Minneapolis dude. He was like the Minneapolis Norwegian American band leader back in the day, along with Thorstein Starning. At least the internet's correct, and uh, you know the internet's always right. So where where can you go wrong with that, right? So let's hear a Shadish or a Rhinelander, as they call it in uh, Norway. <laughs> Thank you. 
it's kind of like, you know, the music with the home recordings that we listen to only if you added, like, a Bud's Bunny track to it, you know? With all those different crazy orchestra instruments and all that stuff. Pretty, pretty darn cool. So, uh... Yeah, so next up, we're going to have another great find this week. One one, the one, one of the, my best finds this week was this, uh, this, these group of musicians. Now, this is just guitar, banjo, tenor banjo, and, um, fiddle, which, you know, if you added the accordion, might be the quintessential upper Midwest old-timey band right there. Um, I'm really digging lately the tenor banjo sound when it's when it's done in a special kind of way like i think this is but uh these are just three guys three old timers who uh played together and uh you know for fun mostly they weren't in like a band they didn't have like a band name or nothing but um they were they they were great they played this radio station in the late 80s and that's what that's what this tape is from playing live on the radio in the 80s i called the radio station i tried to track down either the musicians or the dj um the the uh the dj I, who who ran the show um what he's and this is up in um uh world he's in uh he it says he's in 93 and he's in uh Grand Forts but I can't I can't find him at all and uh the the musicians have died so at least the the fiddler died so but this is this is great this is Wally Berger and uh some other fellows playing some great great tunes on uh very, you know very northern very northern Minnesota uh, radio. I mean, you know, world's as close as you can get to Canada up there. So. <laughs> So that was Wally and True there. We're going to let them do one more. We're going to let them do a waltz here. They sound so much. In fact, that tune that they just played is one that the Erskine Old Timers play. And the Erskine Old Timers almost had the same exact uh, uh, instrumentation. They had guitar, they had tenor banjo, and they had fiddle. So when they're playing that tune, it sounds almost exactly like those guys. But those guys are another what, you know hundred miles down down the road to the west um and a little bit south a little bit south a little bit west um but it's amazing how how similar how similar they sound um and so now we're gonna have them do a, do a waltz a great a great great fast waltz you know that's i still remember that conversation i had with uh lisa blom uh it was off air so you guys didn't hear it but it was maybe well three or four weeks ago and she said uh you know that you you're not playing a waltz right up in Minnesota and Wisconsin unless you're playing it fast. So here we go. This one's cooking.
cool. So that was fun, spending some time up in War Road there. Um, now, next up, we're going to have uh, our interview with Twill and Row. Um, this is uh, taking us away from the Scandinavian music, which we've been really heavy on today. We're really heavy most weeks, actually. when Because I guess that's what I'm drawn to, is the mostly Scandinavian uh, fiddle music. I, I try to stray and do the other stuff because the, the upper Midwest is a really diverse place and did have really diverse immigrants come to it. And I need to represent that more. I actually need to do a better job of that. But um, I just really love the Norwegian, American, Minnesota fiddle music. So that's what you, that's what you hear a lot of because that's what I love. Anyways, like I was saying, Twill and Row is a member of the Row Family Singers, who is a modern old-time band. What we're trying to do is we're trying to branch out and we're trying to have what modern folks in the upper Midwest play. And uh, we're going to talk to Twillin. And uh, it's a great interview. He's just a great dude. And uh, then we're going to hear a song from him. And it ends up being a special song to me, which you'll find out coming up here in a minute. All right, this is Hammer Mike with Quill and Row right here. And we're going to talk about traditional music. Normally, we talk about the history of traditional music in the upper Midwest. But today, we're going to be talking about traditional players who play current music, whether it be from here, whether it be from Africa, wherever it be. But we got my good buddy Quill in here. He's just he's just a great guy, outstanding, outstanding young man. Can I still call you a young man? I, that's up to my mom. I'll call you a young man, <laughs> an outstanding young man who uh, really cares about his community, his music, the people around him, his family. I could go on and on. So not to make you too embarrassed, you, but uh, you know I'm a, I'm a I'm a big fan. He's just, he's you. in a band called the Roll Family Singers which does a mix of their own music and traditional music. And we're going to talk to Q right now about, uh, about traditional music. So Q, what kind of stuff did you uh, grow up on as far as traditional music goes? I had a lot of, uh, my parents used to go to a lot of the, the fiddle poles out in North Carolina. Um, I'm writing a comic about one of those right now. I've been writing comics when we can't play and I'm telling the story about one of their trips out there. But um, so there was a lot of uh, that kind of music, you know, more old timey than bluegrass. But my dad in particular had a really eclectic taste. So um, the bands that I remember the most were uh, the Red Clay Ramblers from North Carolina. And I think those guys, um, listening back to them now, because as an adult, I've bought, all, I've bought all their CDs again. And it's just so beautifully eclectic. And then um, Doc Watson. Uh, so I don't think that um, I don't think that the stuff that I was listening to was in a hard, you know, one lane mode. I mean, everything that I was exposed to was in the traditional family, old time and folk, old country. But it was definitely through people that were approaching it with more of a eclectic uh, look at how to do it, I think. Mm -hmm. And then later on, you developed more of a taste for traditional music. What ways did that lead you into well, I had, um, I think like a lot of guys, uh, your age and my age, kind of in this uh, 40s and 50s age bracket, you know, I spent a lot of time after the music that I grew up with doing uh, punk music and hardcore and heavy metal. Um, I've been surprised how many banjo players, claw hammer players I know in particular of our age that are, that have that same story. But I remember really specifically, I was, uh, I was probably about, I don't know, 20. 21 years old and my parents took a motorcycle trip out to the Blue Ridge Mountains and um, came back with cassette tapes and they had found totally by accident they'd found uh, Dwight Diller's uh, Morning Star shop in uh, West Virginia and so they brought me back uh, Piney Woods and O'Death and I put those in and I, I literally you know the hair on my arm stood on end and I just I was sold. I was like, oh, this, this is, it kind of, for me, it brought together the stuff that I grew up with and the stuff that I had discovered on my own. Um, and I've got a lot of thoughts about that, about the relationship between particularly old time music and punk music that uh, I think that you have in, you know, punk music, the, especially the first, the first wave of it, the way I think of it is very, it's very political. I mean, it was angry and it dressed itself up, you know, in, 
chains and plaids and ripped clothes and spikes and safety pins. But the underlying message of especially the first wave to me was very political. You know, it was about social change. It was about social justice issues. And then again, when I was when I was discovering it, which was probably a third generation by then, uh, bands like Minor Threat and Fugazi, um, I think that absolutely carried the torch forward. I mean, it's again, just like with the Red Clay Ramblers, I've been you know, listening to all my Fugazi records again. And it's, it's the same, it's, it's that same social justice message. And I think that old time has a lot of that in it too. I think that it was very much music that was about what was on people's minds. It was on their version of social justice issues, you know, whether it was trouble in the coal mine, whether it was uh, being an indentured servant, it was leaving home because either you couldn't make a living where you were, or you weren't allowed to make a living where you were. Um, and then I think, of course, you also have, if you take it a step back from there, like just kind of the roots of the music you have, um, just like punk is a mixture of a whole lot of different things. I think old time really isn't just this one thing. It's a, you know, it's the fiddle from uh, where France, the guitar from Spain, the banjo from Africa, uh, the dancing from Native American peoples. Um, you know, so you've got this melting pot that is in its infancy anyways, you know, brings a lot of people to the table. And I think that punk tried to do that. I don't think that it succeeded. I think that punk very quickly gave a pretty big middle finger uh, to, to everybody, which I'm not opposed to either, because, you know, you have to have a space for yourself, I suppose, and you got to. So besides the, which, that there are a lot of connections and <clears throat> some differences in punk and punk in the old times community, you know, and I do agree with you that, you know, one of one of the biggest connections is that you know they're at, at their heart they're like do it yourself you know do it with your community types yeah. of music you know you're not performing them to get rich or you're not performing them to uh be world renowned you're performing them because you know it's your connection to your community you know which it's I social think music social music and i think they both share that so i can definitely see where you're coming from on that um besides the social justice aspect of it why is traditional music important to you you know so my uh my granddad my mom's dad was uh so my mom grew up in in southern iowa about 45 minutes from the missouri border her dad uh his family was from missouri and they had come from Kentucky and Tennessee. And my granddad was, uh, so my mom's dad was the first generation in his family. He and his brothers and sisters were the first generation that didn't have any musical ability up until them. So my great granddad and, you know, it was a, a patriarchal thing. Um, they were all fiddle players, all the men you passed the, you know, the father passed down the fiddling to the sons. And so, um, my my granddad and his brothers couldn't fiddle, but uh, they still loved the music. And um, when I was growing up, I'd spend my summers a lot of times down in in Iowa with my grandparents. And my granddad would be the one to put me or my cousins to bed, and he would sing all these old mountain ballads to us um, that he had learned as a kid. When he found out that I that I had started playing traditional music and I wasn't doing punk anymore. He was over the moon and he started talking to me about bands at the time. I had no idea. Like, I literally thought he was making stuff up. He's like, Oh, you play the banjo. Well, what about, do you, do you like the fruit jar drinkers? Do you like, you know, I mean, and, and he had, and at the time I didn't know who that was because I was brand new to it. I knew, you know, I knew what I grew up with and I knew Dwight Diller and I knew what my granddad sang to me, but I didn't know, you know, the names and the history of it yet. And so I remember that conversation now and thinking, wow, my granddad had really good taste. He listened to a lot of stuff. And he would tell me stories about, you know, listening to the Opry when it first came on the air. You know, they get their chores done, their farming done. And then, you know, the treat was to get to listen to the Opry on Saturdays. So it really, um, I don't know. I remember the first time I went to the Scottish Country Fair at McAllister College and I heard the bagpipes. And it was just like that Dwight Diller thing. Like the hair on my arms stood up on end and it just, it spoke to something in my heart. And I think that that's the same kind of thing that, you know, because I attribute it to my, to my granddad's family and the music I heard at home, but you know, it's just in the blood. It just, uh, when I started, well, here's the best way to put it. 
I played the banjo for four. Uh, I played the guitar for 14 years before I ever picked up a banjo, and the banjo made sense to me almost right away in a way the guitar never did. And then specifically today, what what is the song or tune that you want to talk about today and play for us? Oh man, I have been thinking about this, and I think because I was talking about my granddad, I'll play one that I learned from him. It's a yeah. play party song, a King Kong Kitchi Kitchi Kaimyo. Oh yeah, I just love this song. It makes every time I play it, I think of my granddad, and it just it makes me really happy. One of my favorite people is who I originally heard this song from, and he was a member of the Twin Cities community, and um, he's he's passed within the last couple of years. So it's it's a cool special song to me too. So King Kong Kitchi Kitchi Kaimyo by Chubby Parker. He took uh, Frog Wen Accordin, a ballad that by the time he got his hands on it was four hundred and thirty some years old. And uh, he mixed it with an old Western swing song called Sing Song Kitty.
All right, well, that was Quill and Roll there. Uh, it got a little messed up. It got a little jarbled on my end, so I don't know how it sounded on your end. But um, I'll post the tune separately in the uh, in the feed for the, for the show. Thank you all for listening this week. Uh, we've gone an hour, so I'm going to be done. I have more stuff, but I'll I'll save it for next week. Um, once again, if you like the show, PayPal's Unarmed Journal at hotmail.com, and Venmo is at Clawhammer Mike, and it's not Vanmo like I have up there. It's Venmo. So Venmo is at Clawhammer Mike. Thanks for listening, everybody, and we'll we'll see you next time.